commemoration and a pledge. What the Allies did together 80 years ago far surpassed anything we could have done on our own. Ukraine has been invaded by a tyrant bent on domination. A teacher changing lives. If Dr. Nathrani never actually became a teacher, she never taught in Hopwood, I don't know how I would or how me and my peers would kind of like adapt to the ongoing um, society that we have. And soy sauce ice cream? It's the most delicious ice cream. It's got, it tastes like sesame seeds. Today is Friday, June 7th, and this is VOA's International Edition. I'm Scott Walterman. History tells us freedom is not free. If you want to know the price of freedom, come here to Normandy. Come to Normandy and look. U.S. President Joe Biden made an impassioned call for the defense of freedom and democracy at the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landings in Normandy, urging Western powers to stay the course with Ukraine and not surrender to Russian tyranny. The United States and NATO and a coalition of more than 50 countries standing strong with Ukraine. We will not walk away. Because if we do, Ukraine will be subjugated and will not end there. Ukraine's neighbors will be threatened. All of Europe will be threatened. With war raging in Ukraine, on Europe's borders, the anniversary of this turning point in World War II carries special resonance. It takes place in a year of many elections, including for European Parliament this week and in the U.S. in November. Ukraine has been invaded by a tyrant bent on domination. Ukrainians are fighting with extraordinary courage suffering great losses, but never backing down. Biden urged Western and NATO allies to recapture the spirit of D-Day and work together at a time when he said democracy was under greater threat than at any time since the end of World War II. The Allied forces of D-Day did their duty. Now the question for us is, in our hour of trial, will we do ours? We're living in a time when democracy is more at risk across the world than any point since the end of World War II, since these beaches were stormed in 1944. Now we have to ask ourselves, will we stand against tyranny, against evil, against crushing brutality of the iron fist? Will we stand for freedom? Will we defend democracy? Will we stand together? My answer is yes and only can be yes. So let's go deeper. Joining us now to talk about this is Jesse Driscoll, a professor of political science and chair of the Global Leadership Institute at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego. So the speech today, he he, he took the opportunity to um, bring up the issue of Ukraine and, and NATO. Um, it was a good opportunity for him to do that. Yeah, I think it was a vital opportunity that he would have been a fool to waste. Uh, there's a, an evil in the world today, and making clear that there's a case for an analogy between the isolationists of the 1930s and 40s and the isolationist forces in the Republican Party today that um, were on the wrong side of history in the 1930 and 1940s and are probably also on the wrong side of history today. Uh, of course, Biden should make that case. I'm proud that he did. I, you know, I don't think a lot of people um, know this, but this America First actually was used in the 1930s uh, in making the case against getting involved in the war in Europe at that time. Yeah, I don't think most Americans do know that. Um, there's a funny thing happening in American politics right now where there's – it's kind of a combination of trolling and um, ironic use of fascism in the Republican Party that um, I think is really quite scary. And unfortunately, it, it, um, it, it doesn't scare everyone the same way that it scares me. 
but there's um, something hiding in plain sight, not just in the United States, but unfortunately in far-right authoritarian populist movements all over the world that is um, – uh, you know, unfortunately, when when people with my profile say that, I, it seems to just strengthen the hand of my political opponents. So I don't want to offend anybody, but um, it's it's scary, and the analogies are obviously intentional, um, uh, and it's it's a kind of a dog whistle to some um, some parts of the American electorate. Unfortunately, um, it's a it's a feature, not a bug. Yeah, I, I hear you. It's it's always very hard to talk to people today in this atmosphere if you don't completely and totally agree with them sometimes. And it's not that I think they're wrong. It's just that I think they don't understand what they're saying. And this is the perfect example of America First did not originate in the last six years. It's something that was used 80 90 years ago in the United States to make the point that we have nothing to do with that war in Europe, leave it alone? Well, uh, again, I think that history can be a teacher. And I think that World War II, because of the way that it's been memorialized as a good war, and there's a lot of consensus on why, um, the more that we can make the case that the challenges today with the ongoing genocide in Ukraine, I think it's okay to use that word, um, the aggression and the assault on the rules-based international order. These are reasons to resist the isolationist impulse. It's, it's just not the case that U.S. military force is always a force for evil in the world. Um, and, you know, D-Day is a perfect opportunity to stand, as Ronald Reagan did, and draw a contrast between uh, what America can at its best do with its moral force in the world and its authority in the world and its, you know, yes, economic and military power in the world. Um, I think America's moral leadership and leadership in the institution of NATO, uh, which we should remember, was a uh, Churchillian concept. It was originally the Atlantic Charter um, because we do have interests in Europe, vital interests in Europe. Um, this is this is the um, the peace dividend, uh, and it, it, we we shouldn't we shouldn't squander it. It would be almost unimaginable today to try to make the argument that you know Nazi Germany is not our problem. The way that the argument is being made that the Russia Ukraine issue is not our problem. If you view Ukraine as potentially the first domino for a uh, assault on the rules-based international order and a clear example of an attempt by a big country to annihilate another country's sovereignty, which was in World War II the first step to the Holocaust. First you make Poland's sovereignty go away and then a whole bunch of bad things happen to the citizens of a state that doesn't exist anymore. We have to remember that that's what Putin tried to do in February 2022. If his war plan had been implemented, it would have been really horrible. And today people take for granted that this is a small localized contained war in eastern Ukraine, and so America doesn't have any interests there. But everyone needs to remember what Plan A was. And Plan A looked an awful lot like Hitler's Plan A. Just because he doesn't have the capacity to take all of, over all of Western Europe doesn't mean that this is not the kind of war that everyone should want Russia to lose. Thank you. Thank you so much for the time. Sure, man. Professor Jesse Driscoll at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego. So so let's go back to D-Day, to the commemoration for a moment. You know, I was, I was struck by the fact that this is the 80th anniversary of D-Day. That means if you were a soldier on the beach that day and you were 18 years old, you would be 98 years old today. There aren't that many of the Normandy vets left, and in a few years, there likely won't be any still alive to commemorate this day. VOA's Kane Farabaugh brings us the story of one such vet who did make the trip this year, most likely for the very last time. Okay. Dick and Dot Rung are enjoying a long-lived retirement in Carroll Stream, Illinois. Mr. Rung, who turns 100 in September, admits the most important moments of their seven-decade relationship include their wedding day and the birth of their children. But another important moment seared into his memory 
is one that also turned the tides of history. Omaha Beach, France, D-Day, June 6, 1944. In an old diary he kept, You think this worth anything? <laughs> one Rung admits was against military rules is the simple entry of his efforts to transport U.S. soldiers from England to the beaches of Normandy, France, seasick and scared. On the morning of June 6, 1944, Richard Rung and the crew of LCT 539 were among the first wave that landed here at Omaha Beach. Our guys were falling all over the place. Word from shore reached his commanding officer. He said, we are being slaughtered like hogs. Many of those who fell that fateful morning in 1944 are buried at the Normandy American Military Cemetery in Colville-sur-Mer, France, overlooking the beaches once stained with American blood. Terrible to tell you, but, but there are guys floating in the water. There are, there are guys, uh, I heard guys yelling and screaming. Rung says he welcomes the outpouring of support and attention for the veterans from all nations, like him, who served in World War II. At a ceremony at Pegasus Bridge, where British forces landed ahead of D-Day, as Rung gathered with scores of veterans in a memorial service, he realized opportunities to participate in moments like this, for him, are dwindling. I said to Dad, uh, my wife, I said, this, this is the last time. Rung hopes when he can no longer attend, the markers of white that neatly lined U.S. military cemeteries across Europe will continue to carry a message and a lesson to future generations to never forget what was sacrificed and what was saved by what they did here 80 years ago. Kane Fairbaugh, VOA News, Colville-sur-Mer, France. We're following these other stories from around the world. A report by the UN Children's Agency says 181 million children younger than five live in severe food poverty that's more than 25% of the world's youngest children. Africa's population of more than 1.3 billion people is one of the most affected. An Israeli strike on a school sheltering displaced families in central Gaza killed at least 37 people, including 23 women and children. That, according to Palestinian health officials, the Israeli military claims the school was being used as a Hamas compound. A court in Russia's far eastern city of Vladivostok on Thursday began the trial of an American soldier arrested earlier this year on charges of stealing. Staff Sergeant Gordon Black flew to Vladivostok to see his girlfriend and was arrested after she accused him of stealing from her. He faces up to five years in prison if convicted. In our continuing coverage of the 2024 U.S. presidential election, Donald Trump faces the prospect of prison time after a New York jury convicted him of falsifying business records in a hush money trial. The legal process casts uncertainty on his campaign and future election chances. Tina Trent reports from New York. Donald Trump was found guilty of falsifying business records as part of a conspiracy to suppress damaging information ahead of his 2016 election. Convicted during this presidential campaign, the ruling raises questions as to how Trump will continue that campaign if he's sent to prison. Former federal prosecutor Stephen Cohen does not expect Trump will be incarcerated soon. There will be intense post-trial motions and then there will be an appeal. And that appeal will take um, months if not more than a year. So I think much of this will feed the political drama more than it will feed the story, at least initially, of Donald Trump's fate as a consequence of this conviction. Trump's sentencing is set for July 11th. Legal experts say the length of any prison term would likely be far less than the charge's 20-year maximum. Joseph Tully is a criminal defense attorney. Given his age, given his lack of criminal history, and given that the result here... Um, it really speaks for itself that he's actually not looking at a lot of punishment, uh, very significant punishment. Others point to the prison time already served by Trump's former personal attorney, Michael Cohen, as precedent for Trump's sentencing. Defense attorney Abby Smith teaches at Georgetown Law School. It's very rare 
for an underling in a conspiracy to get jail time and the kingpin not. Donald Trump was at the top of this criminal conspiracy and um, Michael Cohen did some serious jail time. He spent months. Um, so there is some precedent for a judge sentencing Mr. Trump to jail. Alternatives to prison include probation, house arrests, and fines. But it's most likely that any sentence won't be carried out until after the appeals process, which is liable to go past Election Day in November. Whatever sentence materializes next month, it'll inform sentencing for the three criminal cases that are still pending against Trump. Pre Barrara is a former U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York. The fact of this conviction here, if it's still on the books, um, would result in a potential higher prison sentence in those future cases. So it, it does have a consequence because he will now, unlike a week ago, have a criminal record, and criminal records are taken into account in meeting out punishment. Of the other federal and state charges Trump is facing, the Florida trial for those involving mishandling of classified documents is further delayed. Tina Trin, VOA News, New York. Today's International Edition continues. I'm Scott Walterman. Zimbabwe is facing long hours of power cuts due to its dilapidated infrastructure and the impact of recurring droughts on hydropower. To help, the United Nations Development Program is installing solar panels on government-owned health facilities. Columbus Mavunga reports from Bulawayo. Health centers in 15 countries have installed solar power through the United Nations Development Programs. That includes more than 1,000 health centers in Zimbabwe. 13.03 megawatts, which account for 35% of all independent power production. Dr. Nasisi Janga is the chief medical officer at Impilo Central Hospital. It's a real game changer. Authorities hope the switch to solar energy is seamless at all health facilities in Zimbabwe installed with solar power and access is released to the national grid. Columbus Mavungam, VOA News, Bulawayo, Zimbabwe. You know, it is often said that a teacher can change the course of a person's life. This is one such story about a teacher who inspires students in a place where dropping out is so common, it's not that unusual. According to the National Center for Educational Statistics, high school students who identify as Pacific Islanders have one of the highest dropout rates in the United States. VOA's Jessica Stone introduces us to an immigrant teacher in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. Her mission is to change all of that. Let me know if you need any help with using your pod. 30-year-old Rhea Nathrani has yearned to teach since she was a young girl, newly arrived from India to CNMI, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, a U.S. territory in the Pacific. So I would line up my dolls um, every after school and pretend that I was teaching a class of students. These days, her classroom is full of other teachers trying to learn how to overcome the barriers of educating students in the Marianas, where 38 percent of the population lives in poverty. And tropical storms can cancel school for months at a time. They are not really thinking about education at that time. And then when we finally do get back to school, we have this huge educational gap uh, with where we left off a few months ago and where they're expected to be by the end of the year. Nathrani believes technology can help close that gap. Even before the pandemic standardized online learning for grade schools nationwide, she traveled the Marianas, training teachers to develop compelling online courses, implementing distance education to supplement staff shortages on the remote islands, and teaching students to build spreadsheets, create graphics, and to write resumes. One of those changed lives is high school senior Jane Masunder. If Dr. Nathrani never actually became a teacher, she never taught in Hopwood, I don't know how I would or how me and my peers would um, kind of like adapt to the ongoing 
um, society that we have and the, the development of technology. Masunder will enter college in the fall and is considering a career in education. For Nathrani, that choice is the definition of her own success. Just because we're from a small island, it doesn't mean that their opportunities are limited. Jessica Stone, VOA News. And finally, would you try olive flavored ice cream? Or how about a sorbet made with malt vinegar? So I love olives. They are my favorite thing ever. And this tastes exactly like the Pirello olives. So it's delicious. In London, there is a store called the Ice Cream Project by Anna Hindmark. Well, it's, it's sort of a pop-up store. And it's back for a third summer with more unconventional flavors. Well, the most popular and one which, in fact, we brought back from last year is the Kikaman soy sauce, which people were very dubious about until they tasted it. And it's the most delicious ice cream. It's got, it tastes like sesame seeds. It's delicious. In addition to Perello olives and Kikaman soy sauce, other flavors this year include Sun Pat crunchy peanut butter, McVitie's penguin chocolate bars, Branston Piccalilli, uh, it's sort of a yellow-colored relish of pickled vegetables and spices, as well as sorbets made with Saracen's malt vinegar or Tropicana orange juice. Bon appetit! This has been International Edition on The Voice of America. On behalf of everyone here at VOA, thank you so much for spending this time with us. For pictures, stories, videos, and more, Follow VOA News on your favorite social media platform and online at voanews.com. In Washington, I'm Scott Walterman. Next, an editorial reflecting the views of the United States government. This month marks the 35th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square Massacre. We remember the tens of thousands of peaceful Chinese pro-democracy protesters who were brutally assaulted for standing up for freedom, human rights, and an end to corruption, said Secretary of State Antony Blinken in a statement. Thirty-five years later, the true toll from that day is still unknown. But we honor all those killed and imprisoned on June 4, 1989, and the days that followed. We also honor the many voices now silenced throughout the country, including in Xinjiang, Tibet, and Hong Kong, said Secretary Blinken. According to the most recent State Department Human Rights Report, genocide and crimes against humanity occurred during 2023 in China against predominantly Muslim Uyghurs and members of other ethnic and religious minority groups in Xinjiang. Indeed, since 2017, more than one million Uyghurs and members of other predominantly Muslim minority groups have been held in extrajudicial internment camps, prisons, and an additional unknown number subjected to daytime-only re-education training. In Hong Kong, the national security law passed in 2020 is being used by the government there to arrest, try, and sentence pro-democracy activists, and press freedoms have been severely curtailed. Many political prisoners in China remain either in prison or held under other forms of detention, according to the Human Rights Report, including, among others, writer Guo Feng Xiang, Uyghur scholar Ilham Toti, and Tibetan Buddhist monk Go Sharab Gyatsu. We will continue to speak out and work with the international community to promote accountability for the People's Republic of China's human rights abuses, both within and outside its borders, said Secretary Blinken. We echo the call of the brave Tiananmen Square demonstrators for the PRC to recognize and respect the human rights and fundamental freedoms enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to which it is a signatory. The United States also calls on the PRC to accept the recommendations made this year during the Universal Periodic Review of its human rights record, including unconditionally releasing those it has arbitrarily and unjustly detained. As Beijing attempts to suppress the memory of June 4th, the United States stands in solidarity with those who continue the struggle for human rights and individual freedom. The courage and sacrifice of the people who stood up in Tiananmen Square 35 years ago will not be forgotten. That was an editorial reflecting the views of the United States government. 